It's another Radio Who, What, Why podcast. In San Francisco, I'm Peter B. Collins. And today, I welcome the author of a fascinating new book about the Chernobyl nuclear accident. And it's a book about much more than just the nuclear facility, the accident that occurred in 1986, and what we have or have not learned from that. Sarah He Plokey has authored Chernobyl, the history of a nuclear catastrophe, and I just uh, mispronounced his name after practicing because he schooled me that the K is silent. Serhi Plohi, spelled P-L-O-K-H-Y. He is the Mikhailo Hrushevsky <laughs> Professor of Ukrainian History and Director of the Ukrainian Research Institute at Harvard University. Professor, thanks for being my guest today. Well, it's, it's a pleasure, and of course, it's hard enough to have one unpronounceable name, but you ended up with the author who has two, one, his last name, and then the, the name of the person after whom the chair was called. But you did quite well. It's a pleasure. Well, I, I do my best, and uh, feel free to correct me as we go along if I mangle any of the other names, because your account of the Chernobyl accident and the, the uh, events that followed it really fascinated me. It is a riveting description of the errors that occurred and the calamity that followed it, the cover-up that was attempted. And uh, you really take us there in a kind of first-person account. And uh, in a moment, I, I want to get into that account. But there's something really important that I drew from the book, my biggest takeaway, and that is that you believe that Chernobyl really was a critical element in the breakdown of the Soviet Union. And I find this a fascinating analysis that differs from what was fed to us here in the United States during the 1980s as uh, the uh, Gorbachev government uh, faced many challenges and uh, the Soviet Union ended up being dissolved. Uh, talk a little bit about that, Professor, because I think that is the most significant takeaway from your book. Well, uh, thanks. Indeed, this is one of key arguments of the book, uh, which is uh, based on linking the Chernobyl disaster to the disintegration of the Soviet Union. And uh, the, the broader idea is that major technological disasters, they really can uh, bring about collapse of, of states, uh, uh, even, even powerful states. In the case of the Soviet Union, it would be, of course, uh, absolutely uh, incorrect and irresponsible, especially for a professor to um, uh, say that there was just one reason for the fall of a, a major superpower. So explaining the fall of the Soviet Union through Chernobyl alone is, uh, wouldn't be right. But explaining the fall of the Soviet Union without Chernobyl wouldn't be right either. And what I do in my book, I demonstrate the way in which, first of all, the Soviet handling of the disaster the refusal to tell to people like myself, who at that time lived behind the Iron Curtain, what kind of dangers we were facing. Eventually, it caught up with the regime, and the first mass mobilization against uh, the Soviet authority, the authority of Moscow, was taking place in a country like Ukraine or in Lithuania, the country that was the first to declare independence from the Soviet Union, under the banner of ecological movement, ecological mobilization, in book I called it eco-nationalism. Mm -hmm. And um, in case of, uh, again, Lithuania, this is important because that was the first declaration of independence. In case of Ukraine, uh, because that was last in a sense that after Ukraine declared independence, the Soviet Union was dissolved within one week. Mm -hmm. And uh, the leaders of the uh, national movements in both republics and in some other republics like Armenia, they would point to you that the origins of their movements, the origins of mass mobilization is in this uh, um, really protest of the of the society of people against against the uh, regime of secrecy. Mm 
that surrounded uh, Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you describe in the book, this is what pressed uh, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev into the first exercise of glasnost. Uh, He had to come clean because uh, uh, the uh, Geiger counters, the measure of radioactivity that came from Chernobyl was picked up uh, in neighboring countries like Sweden and Denmark. And it really forced the hand. They could not keep this uh, under wraps uh, using the state organs of propaganda, uh, Pravda and Izvestia, and uh, the ordinary control that they had been quite accustomed to up until this dramatic event. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, yes, Chernobyl caught Gorbachev and people around him right in the middle of their transition from the all Soviet times, the regime of secrecy, to a new era, uh, era of uh, glassness to openness, and then perestroika, so the mm, uh, restructuring. So all uh, those, uh, all these words that are markers of Gorbachev's reforms, they were not in place in April of 1986 when Chernobyl took place. Mm-hmm. And uh, Ch- uh, Gorbachev overall and people around him uh, don't come across very as, as, as heroes, more, more like perpetrators in, in, in the story of Chernobyl and in particular in my reading of Chernobyl. It took Gorbachev 18 days to address the nation on on the issue of what happened at Chernobyl. And even then, one third of that speech were attacks on the United States, on on, uh, Western uh, leaders of the West European countries for uh, criticizing the Soviet Union for not releasing enough information. So first of all, of course, the um, news about Chernobyl were broken not by the Soviet government, but by the Swedish authorities who uh, detected uh, rising levels of radiation at one of their own nuclear plants and were really alarmed. It took them a while to figure out that it was nothing wrong with the plant, but that the wind was uh, uh, blowing from the wrong direction, from the other side of the Baltic, from the other side of the Iron Curtain. So really, as you said, Chernobyl uh, uh, and and the reaction in the West and then reaction within the country itself forced Gorbachev's hand and the policies of glasness really started with Chernobyl. If uh, the idea of Chernobyl and the fall of the Soviet Union, this is something that I am pioneering to a degree or at least bringing to the fore, the idea that uh, Glasnost and Chernobyl are closely interconnected, it's a common place today in the special literature on the history of the Soviet Union and uh, history of the Soviet collapse. So it's as uncontroversial as it gets. And, and Professor, as I contrast uh, your modesty here uh, in saying, well, Chernobyl wasn't the single cause, but you can't explain the disillusion of the USSR without it, The dominant narrative that was presented here in the United States from the New York Times and the kind of official organs was that it was the solidarity movement in Poland and that Lech Walesa, who led the strikes in Gdansk, uh, was a, you know, a key leading figure. And this was the leading edge of pressure on Moscow to release control of the satellite nations. And so, uh, you know, I, I wanted to get your thoughts in contrasting the, uh, the glasnost uh, uh, model related to Chernobyl with uh, the narrative that was dominant in the U.S. in the 1980s. Uh, Well, uh, certainly the uh, events in Poland demonstrated that uh, the the Soviet regime in its outer empire in Eastern Europe was in trouble, was in crisis. But still it was strong enough to uh, gather forces to suppress the the, uh, Solidarność movement. Uh, Eventually Valencia ended up under, uh, under arrest. And uh, uh, Gorbachev, uh, uh, when he came to power, eventually allowed Poland and other countries to uh, look for their own way to socialism. He believed that none of those countries would ever live socialism. Um, But uh, that was a different set of policies from the policies that he conducted within the Soviet Union. Within the Soviet Union, he was, of course, prepared to use uh, military, something that he refused to do in Poland. Uh, 
and the military was used in the Baltic states, in Lithuania, in, 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 in uh, Estonia. At that time, at the beginning of 1991, which led to a major, major conflict between President Bush at that time, Bush Sr. and Gorbachev, where Bush sent Gorbachev a letter saying that unless that stops, he would have to cut all the uh, programs that were at that place, economic and otherwise, that were supporting or helping the Gorbachev's regime to survive in 1991. So, uh, yes, it's, it's, it's part of the global story of the fall of communism, but it's, it's quite removed from the story of the collapse of the Soviet Union, per se, which again happened uh, in 1991, happened as the result of mobilization of the uh, national movements in uh, first non-Russian republics and then in response in Russia itself. And in Russia, it was led by um, uh, by Boris Yeltsin, of course, at that time. So yes, these are all parts of the same big story. But but uh, again, uh, I, I would say that Chernobyl is 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 much much more important for for fall of the Soviet Union than is Solidarność movement. It's also much more important than, um, for example, uh, Soviet war in Afghanistan. Uh, that received a lot of coverage in the West. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the comparisons were made between the Vietnam experience of, of the United States and the Soviet experience in Afghanistan. Well, in reality, the Soviet regime succeeded in keeping the information about the Afghanistan and Soviet casualties there uh, secret. And never the mobilization of, of the population happened along over that issue, along those lines. When, of course, Chernobyl, that affected everybody. The radiation hit the party members and non-party members, the members of Politburo and not, and eventually that became that became a major, major, uh, created a major earthquake of politi political earthquake in, in the Soviet Union. Professor, where were you on April 25th, 1986? Well, uh, I was uh, at that time uh, actually traveling. I was on a business trip uh, in Russia. Uh, I um, at that time I lived permanently lived in Ukraine, approximately 350 uh, miles away from the reactor. Uh, but uh, f in terms of my memories and memories of uh, everyone, basically almost everyone in the Soviet Union, April 26 doesn't mean much to us, because of course, we didn't learn about the accident until days and days after we were already exposed to radiation. Again, a lot of that information came not from the Soviet government, but from the Voice of America, from BBC, Deutsche Welle, and, and, and uh, other Western, Western broadcasts. Uh, so uh, really, I, I remember the day of May the 4th, and that's that's when I spent most of the day under rain. And a few days later, uh, they told me that actually it was the, the, the Chernobyl rain. The, the, the wind at that, on that day was coming from the north. It was coming from Chernobyl. I also remember another day in May of 1986 when rumors uh, were spread and they were partially kind of based on, on, on some truth, but they were exaggerated that the water contaminated by the Chernobyl explosion in the river of Dnieper was moving towards the city of more than one million inhabitants where I lived at that time. And the expectation that everyone had, and, and I certainly shared them, was that, okay, in the next two, three days when the water will reach the city, it will be a dead city. There would be no one around. I remember just looking around at, at, at people walking on the streets, at, at the children playing and thinking, this is the end of the world. It, 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 it comes to an end. Uh, uh, 30 million people depend on, on Dnieper for its water. And uh, the phenomenon that everyone was afraid of was, uh, is generally known as China syndrome, which means that radioactive radiation reaches the underground waters and poisons those waters. Mm -hmm. That happened to a degree, but not to a degree that people were uh, afraid of. And eventually this uh, particles, radioactive particles, 
uh, they uh, ended up on the bottom of Dnieper and Dnieper reservoirs at that time, so very little reached reached uh, my town. But that was a concern at that time. Now, Professor, in the book, you describe how you kept your young children indoors that entire summer. But explain how you wrestled with the fragmentary information and the rumors that were circulating and the official silence, if not denial, of a significant incident at the Chernobyl nuclear complex. Well, we were we were listening to the to the Western broadcasts, and again, it's from there that the first uh, recommendations came that okay, it would be a good thing to have um, a kind of a wet cloth uh, in front of your door and and um, clean your, your your shoes when when you come into the in, into the building or come into the uh, into your apartment. Uh, so it's it's uh, uh, again it was 1986, but the the idea the impression was like you were somewhere in the 18th century. It was about rumors. Um, so uh, at the end we were trying to do what we could when it comes to our children, for example. And again, I I, I still and my wife in particular still remember that with element of horror how we forced them. To, to, to stay in, 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 in the apartment for a good part of the summer when, of course, uh, everything seemed to be absolutely normal uh, around. That's, that's another part of the story. You can't see radiation. Yeah. And uh, you can either ignore that, like a lot of people who were sent to deal with the consequences of the disaster in the ex- so-called exclusion zone, uh, did and and paid dearly with their health and some with their lives. Others developed uh, developed this uh, uh, all sorts of phobias uh, because if if the radiation cannot be seen, you can imagine whatever you want to either, either completely ignore or be afraid af- afraid of everything. And, and uh, that is that is one of the impacts of Chernobyl on the on the population as a whole which goes beyond something that can be just measured by the by the radiation absorbed by those people it's uh, it's a belief that whatever health issues uh, i might have it comes to chernobyl uh, it comes to the radiation uh, and uh, so, so there is a major psychological uh, Impact and how did it how did it affect you with the disaster like that? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, How did it affect you politically Uh, before Chernobyl? Were you a pragmatic a pragmatic communist, a a loyal communist, and a true believer, Um, or were you never uh, active and uh, aligned with the Communist Party? Well, um, I was a young professor at the at the university at that time and uh, particular professor of history. So uh, the membership in the Young Communist League and, and then the party was basically almost obligatory for someone like me. Mm-hmm. But by the time uh, when I um, did my graduate courses, I don't remember uh, actually meeting anyone of my age who would be a true believer. So the, the 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 regime by that time was already so so corrupt that uh, again the the believers were almost ab- absent. Maybe there were believers in in a older generation, people around Gorbachev, but not but not in my generation. But what uh, what uh, Chernobyl did is um, the the the. Uh, trust the the, the uh, in the new leader in the Gorbachev, and there was a lot of excitement about Gorbachev and, and, and his views and, and his ideas, that trust was really was really undermined. And uh, I remember people around me saying that, well, Gorbachev is finished. After, after hiding that from his own people, he will not be trusted in the West, he'll not be trusted at home, he is done. It turned out to be not the case. Again, he was able to regain his uh, the, the the level of credibility in, in the country to launch his reforms. But I was really surprised when I was working now on the book to go through the KGB 
files and KGB archives. Now they became open in Ukraine after after that uh, mm, protests uh, uh, the Maidan, the Euro Euromaidan revolution. So, and I see KGB reporting on the rumors among the general population and especially among the dissidents. So, and uh, they, they are quite accurate. That's exactly what I heard from my friends and colleagues in the academic circles, that, that Gorbachev would be finished and KGB then reported that. Again, it didn't turn out to be the, the, the case, but that was the reaction, that was the mood at the time among, uh, among um, university professors, university students. And uh, Professor, as we look back at that period of time, you referenced the KGB archives. Uh, what other source material were you able to gain access to? And was this released by the Poroshenko government, or was it on some sort of a scheduled basis that had been put in place by previous uh, leadership in Ukraine? Well, uh, the, um, the documents that I got access to were, again, KGB files and uh, uh, also the uh, materials and proceedings of the government commission, the Ukrainian government commission that dealt with the issues of uh, not the, the, the scientific part of the problem itself and what to do with the reactor, but what to do with the population, for example, resettlement, the question of uh, what levels of radiation are acceptable for the milk <laughs> and what to do with contaminated milk and meat and so on and so forth. So um, uh, some of those materials were really uh, the, the process of the opening of the Ukrainian archives started a long time ago. And with the KGB archives, it's it's a more uh, a complex story. They started it, the, the process under President Yushchenko uh, the, the, after the Orange Revolution of uh, 2004. Then the process was slowed down under the President Yanukovych, so the, the uh, mm, uh, president uh, against whom the, the protest and Maidan took place in 2013 and who eventually found exile in Russia today. And after those Euromaidan protests, really a floodgate was opened and the, the people uh, it, uh, were put in charge of the KGB archives whose real mission is to make them as open as possible. And uh, in that sense, I was the, the, the timing of my work on Chernobyl uh, turned out to be really, I turned out to be quite lucky that I got access to the documents that otherwise probably I wouldn't be able to see. One of the central figures in your book is Viktor Brukhanov, and he was uh, an engineer, but a, not a nuclear engineer, who was promoted to uh, build and manage the complex that uh, ultimately uh, featured, what, four or five reactors uh, at Chernobyl. Uh, describe him for our listeners, because he is a fascinating character uh, who really, you know, did his best. He ended up doing jail time uh, as one of the fall guys for the Chernobyl incident. Well, uh, Brihanov, the director of the, of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, is the character that normally doesn't appear in uh, any major work or any book on Chernobyl. Uh, because he is so controversial, on the one hand, he is the one who is responsible uh, ultimately for what happened at the plant and was sent to prison for that. On the other hand, he is one of the victims as well, was uh, exposed to radiation and uh, really had relatively little to do with the accident itself. Uh, so some people were just blaming him for what happened. Other people didn't know what to do with them. And I thought that his story is really very, very interesting and can be very productive in, in looking at this, at this complexities of the picture and that there is not just white and black in all that story. Uh, I, I put together his story on the basis of numerous interviews that he had been given to, to journalists. Ever, he was released from prison in 1991. And he was, of course, and his wife on the mission to, to basically present themselves and their record as, as 
not as the record of perpetrators, but to a degree victims. I, I, I understood that. And my main goal was to bring together the personal stories of people like Brykhanov with the archival documents that I found and make these things work and work together. But returning to Brykhanov's, Brykhanov's background as an engineer who was not an engineer specially trained in nuclear industry, this is a very interesting phenomenon generally for the Soviet nuclear industry at the time and something that is, uh, again, um, very important for where we are today with our nuclear industry. So Brykhanov is the so-called first generation engineer when it comes to nuclear industry. People who at the time of the mass kind of explosion and ex expansion of nuclear industry are being recruited there. They don't have training, appropriate training. They don't have, the, the, they were not groomed in that culture, safety culture that has to be in the nuclear industry, have this can-do attitude no matter what. And uh, um, in that sense, that, that entire phenomenon of first-generation nuclear engineer with, enough with not enough training and, and safety culture is one of the contributing factors to Chernobyl. When we look today what is happening with the nuclear industry in the world, uh, very few, it seems to me only two reactors are now under construction in the United States. Uh, Germany is going nuclear free. The, the same goal was set uh, for, in front of, of Jap Japanese government. Chinese were uh, the main uh, kind of a contributor to the to the pro construction of new reactors in the last ten years, but now even they become cautious, more and more cautious. And the new frontier is Middle East. So they just declared plans for the construction up to forty reactors in the, in the Middle East. And this is the story which is very close to what we saw in Chernobyl on a number of levels. One of them was, okay, there is just no trained, uh, enough trained uh, nuclear engineers. The, the, this nuclear safety culture doesn't exist. And uh, m most of those places are authoritarian regimes that, of course, have complete control over the information. They are the ones who build the reactors. They're the ones also who control the reactors, which is, again, uh, creates creates a quite dangerous situation. And this is uh, one of the of the uh, takeaways also, and, and maybe lessons that come from Chernobyl that can be of of uh, use today. Well, and when we look at the tsunami, earthquake, and meltdown at uh, in in Japan. Uh, and we see the state of play here in the United States where there hasn't been a plant built and brought in uh, at the bid cost uh, in at least 30 years. We have not uh, resolved the issues of nuclear waste uh, disposal or storage here in the United States. And as I look at it, the, uh, the, the best practices, the strongest model really are in France, where the government has complete control of the nuclear industry, and they completely reprocess uh, all of the spent fuel. And uh, that seems to me to be the state of the art. Uh, can you comment? Yeah, uh, France uh, uh, depends on the on nuclear energy probably more than any other country in the world. Seventy five percent of all electricity uh, uh, are produced in, in in France from nuclear. It seems to me the the um, nuclear industry here in the in the United States amounts for twenty percent or something like that, and the French didn't have accidents uh, of any of any notice since the beginning of their uh, of uh, their nuclear program they are now in charge of the construction one of the firms is in the charge of uh, the construction of the new shelter of a chernobyl reactor uh, the firm called novarka so in that sense they 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 really they really an example and uh, part of that uh, uh, success is really the really the role, strong role of, of, of the government in overseeing this, this program. So uh, 
in that sense, they they provide one one uh, possible way of how how to deal with the dangerous dangers that come from nuclear industry. Um, another um, another uh, factor that can help us is that. Uh, you don't need really a nuclear disaster to happen in your own country. Uh, once Chernobyl happened again, they, they, they uh, were affected in Sweden, they were affected in Britain, they were affected in Poland. And now it's the international community that picked up the bill for, the, for dealing with the disaster. The state that built the reactor, that benefited from it, the Soviet Union is not there anymore. So what I'm trying to say is that the idea would be to take the best practices like they exist in France and bring them to other countries as well, especially to the countries where there is the first generation, as I said, of nuclear engineers, where there is no tradition of nuclear safety culture. So in uh, enforcing the the, uh, uh, making even stronger than there today, the instruments for the international control over nuclear industry in other parts of the world. Because again, the nuclear industry is managed nationally as long as things go well, but it becomes an international problem once they don't go well. And uh, um, in, in, in that sense, again, uh, I, I, I look at a two-prone approach, strengthening the role of the state, but also strengthening the role of international Uh, overseers in general. Well, I I take your point, and I submit that in Fukushima, we have not learned much. Uh, We have downplayed the risk of uh, radiation approaching the western coast of the United States. Uh, We had a system of uh, radiation detectors, and it turns out that many of them are not functional here. And uh, the radioactive water that has been pumped into uh, the Sea of Japan from Fukushima uh, gives me grave concern, but our official leaders and even our scientific leaders uh, don't appear to be helping the public understand the risks uh, to any great degree. Would you agree? Well, I I, I, I certainly agree, and uh, um, I I can give you uh, one example on on how uh, countries and governments react very differently to the nuclear danger, depending on how dependent they are on, on nuclear energy at home. So um, uh, the uh, clouds that, the radioactive clouds that came from Chernobyl, they of course passed the, the entire Europe all the way to Britain, uh, causing a lot of anxiety and, and all sorts of measures, protective measures in Poland or in Germany, in Britain but not in France. In France, there was complete silence. Allegedly, there were no Chernobyl effect or impact on, on France at all. The reason for that was, the, the, again, the, the importance and the power of the nuclear industry in that country. In Japan, that depended enormously on nuclear power, when they were issuing in 1986 all sorts of uh, comments, including it was G7 on, on Chernobyl, the, the words that could potentially provoke some uh, uneasiness or panic in, in, in Japan over their own nuclear industry. We actually struck from that document. A few months ago, the, the, that uh, very interesting work on that was published. So again, uh, the, the, the governments react uh, to, to very same phenomenon to, with very different responses. One thing that is happening now with the nuclear industry, which is which is worrisome um, on, on, for different reason and on a different level, in the last two years, a number of major uh, nuclear companies, including Westinghouse, filed for bankruptcy. They can't compete, and they can't compete not only with shell gas. But today it would be easier to get a unit of energy uh, produced by, or uh, cheaper to buy a unit of energy produced by renewables in Mexico than a unit of energy produced by nuclear power plant in the United States. So for the first time we see the phenomenon where it's not just the issue that the nuclear industry is maybe not competitive on the basis that it is so dangerous,
but it's also economically it's it's difficult for them to compete. I know that in Ukraine the country still depends. 50% of its energy comes from, 50% uh, uh, of its electricity comes from nuclear energy. So the uh, workers at the nuclear power plants, including one of them is the largest in Europe, uh, went on strike because they were not paid. And uh, I, 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 I just think what that means for the nuclear industry as a whole, where it, there is no money, there is no resources, but there is, there is this dangerous technology there. And as you said, the, the uh, uh, spent fuel, this is the problem with which we are burdening our children and grandchildren for, for, for thousands of years to come. So um, I, I, I think that, that uh, well, uh, nuclear energy never recovered from Chernobyl. If you look at the, at the graph of how many reactors were being built in the world, the peak comes in 1985-1986. Then Fukushima delivered another major blow to, to the nuclear industry. And now the, the really the um, rise of renewables, because the, before that the nuclear energy had this uh, claim that, well, if you, if you don't like the climate change, we are clean energy, we can, we can actually deliver that. Now it becomes more and more difficult to, to advance that claim. And there is a change in the industry and like any change, it, especially with the nuclear industry, it's, it's the time to be very careful and, and to look what is happening there and uh, uh, maybe intervene if necessary. Professor Ploey, in the book, you sum up the long-term impact of Chernobyl. In Ukraine alone, close to 38,000 square kilometers, about 5% of the entire territory, inhabited by about 5% of the population, were contaminated by the explosion. Even hit harder was Belarus, with more than 44,000 square kilometers of land severely con contaminated, about 23% of that republic's territory, 19% of the population. And uh, you talk about the impact in other areas of Russia, uh, uh, c contaminating up to 60,000 square kilometers. Then when you look at the official death toll, uh, the total uh, comes up to about 50 who died of acute radiation syndrome, uh, another uh, 29 or so from the immediate uh, uh, incident itself. But the long-term impact on populations uh, is much harder to track. And the UN agencies have uh, suggested as many as 90,000 people uh, were uh, subject to early mortality. Uh, am I getting that right as a result of Chernobyl? Uh, yes, the, the UN estimate is low. It seems to me around 6,000. Greenpeace is around 90,000. And uh, uh, indeed, it's, it's, it's very difficult to, to basically figure out what, what the overall impact has been. We know for sure some of the figures and, and the number of people who died is one of them. Another is the spike um, of the cases of thyroid cancer among children in particular. So there are uh, between four and 6,000 additional cases were registered. So that we know for sure that's, that everyone agrees on that. With the rest, it's, it's really very difficult to judge. The reason for that is that most of what we know about radiation comes from the uh, uh, ex explosions of nuclear bombs at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So the idea is that it's an enormous amount of radiation released over a very short period of time. Chernobyl, it's the other way around. It's uh, lower dosages of radiation released over a longer period of time and then getting into the soil and living there for decades and, 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 and hundreds of years. So uh, the, the toll, the, the final toll of Chernobyl, maybe we'll be able to talk about that 40, 50,000 years from now, mm -hmm. if the world is still around. Well, Professor, I want to thank you for a fascinating book that unlocks a lot of the secrets and the, uh, the hidden history of the nuclear catastrophe at Chernobyl in 1986, the result of uh, testing during a planned shutdown that went uh, horribly awry. 
And as I say, you introduce us to many characters. You define the the frame of uh, of Soviet operations at the time,、uh, the way the government worked and and didn't work.、Uh, and it is just a fascinating look that is a a very interesting read. And you bring these characters to life in such a fascinating way. As we close the interview. I, I just can't resist asking you to spend a minute or two telling our listeners about Yefim Slavsky, and maybe this is just the curiosity of transliteration, but his job title was Minister of Medium Machine Building, <laughs> <laughs> and he was a central figure in the Soviet nuclear、uh, weapons and nuclear、uh, generation industries. Is that correct? Yes, yes, he was、uh, not just one of the most powerful. He was the most powerful figure、uh, and minister in the Soviet government for、um, at least thirty years. So、uh, he was one of the uh, early uh, participants of the Soviet、uh, atomic project, one of the fathers of the Soviet atomic and then hydrogen bomb. And since late 1950s, he was the minister of this strange creation, Ministry of Medium Machine Building, which was basically a Soviet nuclear industry, top secret Soviet、uh, nuclear uh, industry. Uh, and under him were military units, and uh, uh, so he, he was presiding of the of the entire empire. The、uh, Institute of Nuclear Energy was not the institute of, that belonged to the Academy of Sciences, like most of the institutes did, but belonged to Slavsky's ministry. And the director of that institute, Mr. Alexandrov, one of the、uh, scientific advisors to the creators of the Chernobyl-type reactor,、uh, he、uh, was also the president of the Academy of Sciences of the Soviet Union. So Slavsky owned. Um, Alexandrov had owned the institute and owned the Academy of Sciences, so that was the power of the nuclear project in the Soviet Union. The person who was presiding over it since、uh, the late 1950s. Eventually, he was also put in charge of、uh, creating of this what became known as sarcophagus, so burying the reactor. He did that and was、uh, quietly retired after that. So the, the the entire era ended with that. But his dream was to stay in in、uh, his position until he was 100 years old. He was already in his 80s, still in good health,、uh, was exposed and overexposed dozens of times to high levels of radiation. Again, he started in the 1940s and 1950s, where the nuclear safety was non-existent. And uh, uh, again, his his career ended with Chernobyl, which I、uh, also write in the book that that was also turning the page on a particular, the most dangerous part of the Soviet nuclear program. Well, Professor, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for a fascinating book. I highly recommend Chernobyl: The History of a Nuclear Catastrophe. We've been speaking with Professor Serhii Plohii. Thank you. It was it was a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Peter. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Professor Serhi Plohi. I welcome your comments and feedback. You can email Peter at peterbcollins.com. And if you're able, I hope you'll make a financial contribution to support the investigative journalism here at Who What Why.